Hello and welcome to Sea Trade Cruise Talks. We're back with another episode. Sea Trade Cruise Talks is a series of educational content featuring cruise professionals and industry leaders discussing the challenges and opportunities of the current and future industry climate. You can sponsor a talk to align your brand with innovative thinking and recent trends and to receive highly relevant, engaged leads that are seeking the sort of value your brand provides. Contact us at sales at seatradecruise.com or find us on socials at seatradecruise. And don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to our channel for weekly talks content. Um, I'd like to ask uh, about the technology that we're seeing now um, emerging because what do you see being the impact of technology when it comes to the shoreside experience? Do you think technology will eventually replace talk? I, I mean, for me, I don't. I mean, I, I believe that technology has really enhanced the experience. Um, it, it's funny, we, we work with a, a company um, guiding group and they have, they started off as headsets, but one of the ideas that they have been working through is an automatic translation so that the guide, when they're speaking, would automatically translate and you could put it into whatever language that you like. The technology is out there today to do this. And we were speaking to a guide group and they became, they were, they were offended by it. They said, oh, you know, you're going to take our jobs away from us. But the fact is, is that, you know, there is a push on human resources. Um, obviously we need the guides. But this technology can continue to enhance and enhance the cruise lines so that that we don't need as many guides, because right now the fact is, is there's a shortage of guides in many of these places. There's a shortage of drivers. There's a shortage. There's many, many shortages. So I believe that, you know, this will continue to enhance the different kinds of experiences that we have. You know, the shore, some of the, the technology, even that, let's say, Royal Caribbean has implemented for their embarkation. So that, that, that the touch points that you have to have with humans are less and that you can go through that entire check-in experience where it used to take maybe an hour and a half within 15 minutes. I mean, that right there has changed the entire embarkation experience. And I don't feel that it's taking jobs away from people. There are still, you still have to have that human interaction because we used to always say with shore excursions, um, you know, the guide can make or break your tour. You can have the most amazing tour out there. And if you have a bad guide, you will get negative comments back. You can have an average tour with an amazing guide that can bring the story to life and people will come back raving. So that human touch is so very important, but I believe that the technology that is out there today will continue to enhance the experience of all of our guests, whether it's expediting. Go ahead, Roger. No, no, I'm sorry. I was just going to elaborate as far as the guide and take it one step further. I think a guide makes or breaks the visitor's experience of the entire destination. That people can go to a destination and say, I loved it mainly because the, the person they spent the most time with was the guide. Or, yeah, I, I don't know why we stopped here because of the guide. And it's not just the tour, it's the entire destination is riding on that guide. And we just mentioned before, as far as the human interaction, the human contact, um, I think technology will not and should not eliminate that human element of a destination of a visitor experience, but it should be able to get rid of these kind of choke points. Uh, Shannon mentioned embarkation, boarding tours now. Um, you know, the olden days we were handing out tickets and there'd be tickets everywhere. It's much more efficient if it's all done electronically. You know who's there, you know who's missing, you know who's on the bus, you're not counting tickets. Um, the different types of um, audio systems. I remember in the olden days going into the Hermitage with different tour groups and the tour leaders, the tour guides all screaming at the top of their lungs so everyone could hear them. And it was it was chaos. And it's just so much nicer to have this type of technology available. So I see technology making things better and making it easier too, because for the tour guide, 
if they can be in a more natural, better mood when they're not hurting cats and screaming at the top of their lungs, it, they can be more relaxed. Everyone can be more relaxed. So I think it, it helps everybody. Yes, and Dennis, would you agree with that? Uh, I would agree with that, but lo- let me also add something, an- another parameter of this equation, that if you an- someone analyzes uh, uh, you know, the, the cruise calls and excursions, not all of the passengers go on organized tours. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you've been before the destination, maybe I, you've been to a tour the previous day, some of the passengers do decide for some reason to go on their own. Uh, and yes, their technology can help. Uh, I mean, I've seen uh, projects where you get messages now on where's our discounts on the destination, or you pass by something you, you, want see, you want to find out what's the local product. You know, you mm-hmm. may not know and you get this information. Um, so that, that aspect, uh, aspect of the equation is quite good. But in my mind also, the guides are, uh, you cannot replace them. They can save, they can, they can, you know, cherish, and they can make your experience the best um, uh, or the worst. But usually the cruise lines are so careful to choose guides that are very good. Uh, I will um, uh, agree with Shannon that at the moment we have a shortage of both uh, guides and drivers here in Greece also. And this causes sometimes some problems. But I, I would say this, hand to hand, uh, guides and technology can increase the experience and this is what's all about experience mm. yeah. and I suppose this is much less of a key issue when it comes to the expedition sector because of course people who are embarking on those kinds of voyages are, are you know generally speaking really passionate and, and enthused by what they're going to hear about and learn so it's essential for for a guide to be there to guide them on this journey that's right that's right okay so we spoke a little bit earlier we touched on the destination bottleneck so I just wanted to come back to that because it's an issue that's you know it's a crucial topic that we're increasingly hearing more and more about how are you seeing ports and destinations address this problem? Are there any solutions on the horizon? Shannon, what do you think? You know, I've seen over the years multiple ways that they've tried to address it. Some have started limiting the number of vessels or guests in a port on any given day to control capacity. Um, I remember, and and this is still the case with in Juneau, Alaska, um, that there it was almost as a, a hot birthing where one ship would come in at 7 a.m. and would leave at two, and the other ship would be pulling in around one o'clock, waiting, and then stay until eight, so that you had you could double up the calls on a single day. Um, we also now see with the bottlenecks, we see small ports emerging outside of maybe the marquee ports so that you have your, you know, your primary port of call. But let's look at Venice, who has is, is essentially banned the large ships, but you have Trieste and Ravenna that are receiving ships where the guests can still come into and explore Venice, um, but the ships aren't calling there. So I think that around some of these other marquee ports, um, you may see smaller ports opening their doors for the ships to come in so that the guests can still experience these marquee destinations, but again, providing more berthing um, in, in these different destinations. So I think that we're going to have to get more creative. The cruise ships necessarily do not like um, on a seven day itinerary, they like to leave on the weekends, but we've seen such as in Alaska that there's Friday departures or Monday departures so that they can extend it because there's always that congestion on the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays of the week. So I think that as there's more ships, we're going to have to see more of the cruise lines um, looking also to alternatives to changing their itineraries a little bit, that maybe it's not the ideal weekend departure and they have to have you know, a midweek departure so that you can get into the ports because the ports are getting so bottlenecked. So I think there's a lot of solutions. Um, I know that, you know, there's always the pressure on yields and not necessarily departures during the middle of the week. Maybe the yields might be lower, but maybe there's other opportunities that they can they can offer um, that will continue to enhance the guest experience. For me, I would rather be in a port when it's not as congested 
Um, but you know, it, it really depends on those vacation schedules, but I, I think there's a lot of solutions and, you know, Roger, Giannis. I mean, I, I agree with you, Shannon. I mean, uh, to me, one of the solutions can be a uh, birthing policy, a regional birthing policy, uh, so that uh, you have clear rules, uh, two years, three years in advance, so the itinerary planners, uh, you know, can go in and, and, and all of them respect the same rules uh, and conditions to be able to book. And, you know, it's time that slowly all destinations need to put a capex on their capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't like saying that, but this is the truth and we will see this in the years to come. Um, do, do we want, uh, a, a, you know, a thousand people in a 500 limit uh, place coming in and, and, and crushing themselves or do we want two days of 500? Uh, that's the question we need to ask ourselves. And as we move on in the future, I think this will be more clear and clearer. But as I always say, is this, can, this industry finds a way to balance itself uh, wholly. And I think the solutions, and there are solutions out there. We've seen examples uh, around the world that have uh, you know, assisted and helped the situation, but everybody has to put their part in from the local mayor to the local shopping association, to the cruise line, to the tour operator, to the agent, all of them have to sit in and, and, and derive a plan that will assist uh, going forward. If we want everybody to keep smiling and have a good experience, which is what we want. Absolutely. Now, I want to come to the topic of training, Yanis, um, because the Port of Antigua, it recently launched a community training series. So what are the benefits to ports for holding these types of, of training sessions? Oh, where, where do we start? I mean, as I said, we need to tell a story. Uh, and even though some people are natural, some people have the best intention, not sometimes they know how to do it. So to, in, in, to be able to get someone to properly teach you how you can communicate your passion about your destination, how can you tell the stories, you know, behind the scenes, the story of the families, the story of, this, of the place, is very, very important. You know, whenever I go and travel, I try to talk to the locals because this is how you get the real information, you know, behind the scene information. So it's so, so important. And also let's not forget that cruise lines uh, score every call through the experience the passengers have, either on a, an excursion or down in the destination. So it's so important. And, you know, I will give the hands up to, uh, to whoever, Antigua, or whoever is doing training, because then they can measure the smile meter, as I, I like to call it, the, the, the staff and locals have. And it's so, so, so important to, to embrace the five meter rule. And the five meter rule is, when I see someone less than five meter, I talk, more than five meters, I smile. And this can go a long way on feeling someone welcome and come and talk to you. Mm, Shannon. Um, I, would, I would just add on a little bit to that in the fact that, you know, I think that there's there's training and I think Antigua is definitely, uh, many of the Caribbean ports are very cruise centric um, in, their, in their visitor arrivals. You know, I work with a lot of ports in which um, we are not cruise centric. In fact, we are a very small piece of the business. And I think Part of the training also goes into educating the community on the benefits of cruising and what the cruise ships can bring to the community. Because, you know, over the last few years, we've we've definitely gotten a little bit of a bad rap. And so it's re-engaging with the community to help them understand, you know, the positive side of cruising and the sustainability initiatives that they have in place. And, you know, there's so much that the cruise lines give back to the community when they come into these communities. And I think that, you know, the training helps get that messaging out. So I think part of that goes into the communication and how important and key communication is between the cruise lines and the cruise community in getting out that into the general community and the general population um, so that the cruise industry is embraced for all the positives, some positives that they do bring. Um, now, I wanted to come back to some specific regions now. Um, excellent news coming out of Asia. Southeast Asia received its first cruise call in over two years with Royal Caribbean International's Spectrum of the Seas arriving in Malaysia. So, could you please give us an update on what is happening in the APAC region? Raj, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> Thanks, Shannon. Um, well, <laughs> uh, obviously the restart 
in that region has been slower than the rest of the world. Um, rightfully, wrongly, being more conservative, whatever, it has been much slower. The good news, as you said, Holly, is that things are coming back. Um, Australia's uh, reopening soon. Um, there's a tremendous market there. Um, different parts of Asia are slowly coming back uh, for international travel. The first thing is just getting international travelers, um, which has been a challenge. Uh, so I think it's going to be a slow return to normal. The good thing is I think the cruise industry has proven to the world that they really are on top of it as far as um, their health protocols, um, offering a safe environment, not just on board the vessels, but also to the communities that they visit. Um, I mentioned, we started out talking about trips. I was just in New York and Chicago, and I had no idea if anybody was vaccinated around me. I had no idea about anything. Whereas if I'm on a ship, I have that comfort. And if I'm a destination and I see a ship coming in, I'd like to know that those people on the ship have been vaccinated, tested, um, they've been, their health has been monitored for the period that they've been on the ship, which you don't know about people getting off an airplane. So I think that the cruise lines do bring um, healthy, as safe and healthy as anybody can, and I would say more so. But it is going to be a slow process. Um, China, of course, is the big, uh, you know, the big giant out there. And um, I'm not sure when they're going to be ready to reopen. That's going to make a big difference in everything going on in the um, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, with Carnival's announcement that two of the Costa ships that were built for the Chinese market are going to be coming to the U.S. market, uh, operating as Costa by Carnival. I would say that that's a conservative view of China coming back to where it was a few years ago. I think one day, of course. China will be the biggest cruise um, destination or source market in the world. But I think that day is going to be pushed back a little bit. So it's great news that um, the ships are back in the South Pacific or coming back to the South Pacific and now coming back into um, the um, Pacific and Asian markets. But I think it's going to be a little slower than it has been in the Caribbean and um, European regions. You know, I think to add to that, it, it also goes into their the source markets, right? I mean, and and I'm not as educated on the source markets there to say what kind of, I know in the U.S., right, that pent-up demand, we knew the demand was there. People wanted to get back on the ships, um, but I'm not as certain about the pent-up demand and the source markets there in, in filling the ships over there again. Obviously, the cruise lines are eager to get their ships back over there. Um, the world seems to be becoming a smaller place and there's so many ships out there, you want to diversify your fleets. So I know that the cruise lines are eager to get back into those marketplaces, but again, it goes back to the source markets and what kind of pent up demand is there to fill the ships. A quick return in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Holly. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the Asia region and China was the new kid on the block. Uh, very fashionable, uh, very fast growing, but still new. Uh, and, and that, you know, in terms of the audience, in terms of the sourcing market, uh, not so much ed ed educated. However, uh, they are now restarting from a different point than we were starting two years ago. So we know so much more about the, the, the you know, the pandemic. We know so much more about handling the pandemic uh, on board the ship. And this is a good starting point. So even though it will be slower, I am hopeful that in three or four months time, if we have the same discussion, we will see things picking up uh, much faster. And, and, and let's not forget, but uh, you know, the biggest source market is China. And China, in a way, you know, it's very easily controlled in terms of saying, you know, oh, yes, let's go back into cruising. And we will see a large chunk of the uh, possible passengers going back to cruise. So even though it's slower now, I am hopeful that by the end of the year, uh, we will think, see things picking up again. Uh, we've seen some cruise lines announcing that they will go back in the season 23, but this is still good news, you know. Obviously, they're taking now the chances uh, with the, the high demand in, in this region or in the U.S., but um, I think in the season 23 or even 24, uh, we might be surprised positively on, on, on how the things uh, are going over there. 
Well, let's hope so. We shall have to keep our fingers crossed for sure. Uh, time is almost up. We are thrilled to have you joining us though at Sea Trade Cruise Med in Malaga, taking place on the 14th and 15th of September. Uh, Roger, I know you've already uh, mentioned what you're looking forward to, but can I please ask, what are you all most excited about to learn? What are you all most excited to learn about at the show? Well, since you can, let me just start real quick because I, I did bring it up. Um, the conference sessions, but you know, the three of us, uh, Shannon, Giannis, and I have been working with the Sea Trade team on the conference, and it's you know obviously more so on the sessions that we're going to be involved in and moderating. But the the conference program looks great, um, so I'm looking forward to that. But more important, I, and I can't say more important, it's, you know, it's equally as important, it's just seeing everybody again. So as far as the networking, um, it's great to see old friends, old uh, um, acquaintances, business people, all of that. But I learn so much in just short conversations, just wandering around and seeing people and saying, how's it going? And in these informal discussions, whether it's with destinations or cruise line executives or tour operators or suppliers or you name it i learned so much just wandering around talking to people so i'm just really looking forward to getting together with everybody and seeing everyone i think it's i think it's going to be the strongest uh, sea trade met to date and let me back this up because uh, we had a strong sea trade global uh, but people are, are eager more now we've, we've seen and cruise lines are more open and we will see them in, in, in Malaga. Uh, I've spoken with a few of them and they're going, and this is great news. So destinations out there, go grab your, your, your uh, itinerary planners. Um, we are so excited that we are participating, obviously, in the conference program and we will be moderating some of the sessions. Uh, and, and there we will do the hard questions as we always do, you know, on, on what's ahead in the future in each of the areas. But to me, the most important is what Roger said again. Yes, see old friends and make a new one. I very often say that this is a family. We're in the cruise family, and I love seeing the family, you know, again and again. This is how you learn, how you connect, how you network. And let's not forget, cruising is networking. Holly. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and what's about you, Shannon? What's your the thing you're, you're looking forward to, to learning about most at the show? I have to say I'm ditto with with Roger and Giannis. While I always love the conference programming and it's always so robust and I learned so many things, I really do think it's about the networking and the people. And at the Sea Trade conference, our last Sea Trade conference back in in April, we, we were still missing many of the European cruise lines. So we were still I felt like we were missing still a lot of our colleagues. So I'm really looking forward to connecting in person with so many of these European colleagues that that didn't make it to to Miami um, when they come back. So I know it's going to be a robust Sea Trade as as. Yana said it's probably the best sea trade, sea trade med that, that they've had from the beginning as we all come back. And I, I know it's going to be just a fantastic time in Malaga with a wonderful conference program, which I saw just the first launch of all the, the program titles, which I'm super excited about. Plus, there's a, a couple titles. I know that we're working on a sustainable itinerary planning session. Um, also, the great comeback for, for destinations and the marketing efforts that they've really put in um, to bringing their destinations back to life after COVID. So I'm super excited about that session, too. Excellent. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you. Um, that's all. Thank you very much to our ambassadors. And thank you for watching. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, Holly. Thank you, everybody. Love See you, Bye. Bye. Bye.